speak about calorimetry of an individual uh, facelift. Please, the floor is yours. So, um, hello everybody, and um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, pr present our work. Oops. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about our project, uh, which is on the um, calorimetric detection of uh, individual facelifts in a, a hysteretic RF squid. Um, so, um, calorimetry is uh, one of the most promising methods uh, for detecting energy quanta in uh, mesoscopic systems. And to give you a um, few examples, for example, in the quantum computing domain, uh, there's an ongoing uh, effort to bring the room temperature electronics to the um, chip level and uh, for basically interfacing qubits and uh, accordingly um, having a um, detector which is capable of uh, capturing uh, microwave photons uh, is an important milestone. And uh, some measurement schemes uh, which couples qubits to actually an, um, an absorber uh, can be already found in literature. And um, apart from that, for example, uh, we can also use the calorimetry in uh, single tunneling electron experiments where um, an electron turnstile injects the electrons to the absorber at an uh, desired energy level. Uh, in our case, uh, it's going to be the thermal signature of the tunneling of, a, uh, let's say, Josephson vortex um, in, a, in a hysteretic RF squid. So what we have is basically a superconducting loop uh, where the weakening is made of uh, normal metal. And uh, so we know that if this, uh, the screening, screening of this uh, loop is weak, in that case, uh, sorry, uh, for the point, can I just point this way? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. So, um, so if this loop has a weak screening parameter, uh, in that case, we know that uh, the external uh, flux that we apply and uh, the flux that uh, thread threads the loop is a somewhat, has a somewhat uh, linear uh, relationship. And uh, now if we increase this uh, screening, screening capacity of our loop, uh, in that case, uh, this relationship becomes um, a multi-valued function, let's say. And uh, now if we, um, which allows us to actually, uh, well, it's kind of cut anyways. So which allows us to sweep the external uh, magnetic field uh, up to such a point that if we go uh, further beyond, uh, we have these uh, phase jumps, and uh, which is an irreversible process and therefore is accompanied by uh, instantaneous uh, dissipation. And so this dissipation, maybe we can uh, better appreciate it if you look at the uh, energy, potential energy landscape uh, of our device. Uh, so we have a quadratic term which comes from the loop inductance and then the sinusoidal term which uh, comes from the Josephson energy. And so basically in that uh, framework, uh, applying this external flux uh, corresponds to the, to the tilting of this uh, potential uh, landscape uh, to such an extent that the uh, initial stable point is not stable anymore and that our phase particle which represents the system state uh, basically falls to the next uh, valley. And in that sense, this uh, difference in uh, free energy is basically dissipated. And uh, so if you look at this uh, circuit model of our device, uh, we see that this actually dissip uh, this dissipation is uh, absorbed by the non-superconducting part of our uh, loop and in the form of joule heating, right? So we are, we are basically uh, heating um, actually the electro electronic community uh, of our device. But as this uh, normal part is concealed on both ends by the superconducting leads, actually uh, the, the dominant relaxation mechanism is uh, via phonon, phonons. And uh, given the fact that now uh, actually we uh, operate at sub-Kelvin temperatures, uh, this uh, electron-phonon coupling is uh, weakened. Uh, therefore, this relaxation is actually taking, it's happening in a micro scale, mic microsecond scale. And so, yeah, this is what we want to um, resolve in real time. Uh, to sum up, so yeah, we want to generate facelifts in a hysteretic uh, RF squid and then uh, resolve in real time the heat release coming from this event. 
So if, in practice, if you look at our uh, squid device, so it's uh, something like that. Uh, actually, we made it quite big uh, for two reasons. First, it's, uh, it's helping us to get a hysteretic, uh, it's helping us to be in the hysteretic regime. And also, it's helping us to get a, a better coupling with the flex line. And also, our device is um, embedded in an uh, RLC, a parallel RLC circuit. Um, such that actually which allows us to, uh, um, unlike the conventional measurement schemes, uh, it allows us to do some uh, fast measurements. We basically read the output power uh, at the resonance uh, with, a, with a high bandwidth. And we also, some, we also have uh, an extra piece of uh, circuitry which allows us to impose some, uh, apply some uh, voltage bias on our device. And this way we can get the tunneling spectroscopy uh, of uh, our device. And uh, also I need to mention this third finger uh, that uh, is in contact with our normal metal, but this time with a tunneling barrier. And uh, this way um, we can actually probe the density of states of the normal part. And so what we see is that as this normal part is under proximity effect, uh, means that there is already, uh, there is some uh, pair correlations present uh, in N. And so what we get in the end here is sort of S I S prime Josephson junction. And its signature, we see it at actually zero bias, as, a, as a zero bias conductance. And um, so it has been shown, um, unfortunately, yeah, I cannot, you cannot see here the references, but it, ha it has been shown that actually this uh, zero bias conductance, uh, the, the, the temperature dependence of this zero bias conductance uh, can be used as a very sensitive thermometer. And this is uh, what we are showing here. Uh, basically, the difference in power uh, between 50 millikelvin and uh, 400 millikelvin. And on the right, we are basically tracing uh, this um, output power as a function of temperature. Uh, what we see also is that, um, so as proximity effect is a phase phenomenon, a phase dependent phenomenon, uh, our uh, actually calibration curve, let's say, is also uh, answering, responding to the phase bias that we imposed uh, on the Josephson junction. Um, okay, so uh, next, uh, what we show here is that these are the really a uh, small bandwidth, a small, um, a slow um, magnetic field sweep measurements. We are basically uh, sweeping, like applying a ramp here, and then simultaneously uh, reading the output. And so what we see is that um, basically, okay, yeah, something looked like this jumping first. Uh, but actually, we see that uh, um, our device, this kind of confirms that we are in the hysteretic regime um, because we see that the phase cannot go through full cycle of 2 pi, but uh, the jumps are taking place whenever we are reaching pi over 2. Um, and it, I, it's not shown here, but uh, from these measurements, we can also obtain the uh, beta, the beta the screening uh, parameter, and it also confirms that actually our device is well in uh, hysteretic regime. Um, okay, so up to this point, all of the measurements were like, uh, with this really small bandwidth and uh, let's say static uh, steady state measurements. So I'm kind of getting to what I promised in the beginning. Uh, so next what we do is that on this uh, flux line, we are applying a, a, a fast pulse, uh, which basically um, um, does a back and forth. And this way we get actually a two phase slips round trip. And so, yeah, the, the idea is to um, do this in a synchronous manner with our uh, acquisition device and uh, observe this uh, relaxation. And so this is what we see here. Uh, this is basically the, I would say, the main takeaway of this, uh, of this uh, work. Um, so we repeated this um, fast measurements at uh, different uh, temperatures. And uh, we see that here we, uh, at the, the pulse uh, arrives at uh, zero microseconds. And what we observe is that a, a violent uh, increase of the electronic temperature, the electronic community of our uh, normal metal. And then it basically uh, goes back to initial temperature, but uh, at a, a much slower uh, pace due to the uh, yeah, weakened uh, electron phonon coupling. And as we increase the temperature, um, of course, this uh, first electron-phonon coupling is getting stronger. Therefore, this relaxation is now uh, faster. 
but also the critical current of our uh, Josephson junction is decreasing, therefore we are also depositing less power on uh, N. Also the heat capacity of our absorber is uh, getting bigger. So actually we went up to 250, 200, uh, 300 almost, but at, that, uh, at those temperatures it was just a single point and it was impossible to uh, resolve in real time uh, such a, um, relaxation. So um, next, uh, we just concentrate on the relaxing part here. And we are basically trying to show that uh, actually um, this relaxing part is in line with what theory predicts. And this is the case for the, uh, the let's say, the first part. But it seems as if there are two uh, relaxation mechanisms. And uh, so, it, yeah, this is something we don't really understand, but we argue that there is a, a second phonon bat, maybe uh, due to the magnetic impurities on the surf, uh, copper surface, or, yeah, we are open to discussion <laughs> about this, but, yeah, it's, it seems uh, as, as though there is a, a secondary, a slower relaxation mechanism. Yes? I do not understand why uh, a 7 C minus 7 plus on the two devices, why not a scat function at a okay. multiple set C level? Okay. Um, data, uh, you said, what's the logic behind that? Okay, um, so there are a couple of reasons. Uh, do you mind if I go back to, yeah. So um, as you see, um, our calibration curve, our thermometer is responding to the phase as well. And so to, to, be, to sit on the same uh, calibration curve all the time, we need to come back very quickly to the initial phase. Uh, and if we just do a for, uh, just a step function, uh, in fact, we will be the, after the jump, the phase will be landing on a different point. And we will be basically maybe starting here and then at some point diverging to one of the other uh, lines, okay? And um, the other thing is that, uh, so our, um, it's more experimental. Uh, our transmission line is uh, not superconducting. So if you put a step function, actually you're introducing also heat to your uh, device, which we observe as, a, as a just an, actually an offset in the measured power. Yes? May I ask another question? Uh, the, um, the energy that you release, the SIB, yes. uh, how, much, how does it compare to the gas induced in the normal part? Ah, okay. So uh, you mean the mini gap in the proximity proximitized um, uh, normal metal. So our mini gap is in the so order uh, so of Sorry, uh, can you repeat yeah. <coughs> for the online people? Yes, I was asking how the energy which is released, this delta U, yes. compares uh, to the mini gap in the okay. normal part. Yes, um, so the mini gap, actually Thanks. we can kind of see it here as this uh, convolution integral um, shows us that you know we have basically delta one plus mini gap minus mini gap here. We get two coherent peaks, so it's in the order of several tens of microelectron volts as mini gap. But the dissipation, as I was saying, is quite violent. It's in the millielectron volt range. So we are dissipate. We are actually depositing something around ten to fifteen, even more uh, millielectron volts to the end. So it's just uh, basically shooting the temperature to two hundred uh, millikelvin. Um, so yes, uh, I talked about this uh, relaxing part. And then as the final cure, what we, uh, this is just the, to say that actually everything is in line with uh, our calculations. We are basically taking the delta T for every temperature and then uh, try to, uh, we fit it with our uh, calculations based on the heat capacity of our normal metal. And as I just mentioned, the, the um, energy that we, we are depositing on, uh, on the end. But there is a catch, actually, as it's a round trip face slip. So we are actually measuring two face slips. But the, um, the way back, uh, the second face slip, as it starts from, it, uh, from a higher temperature, actually, it's depositing less uh, energy. And this is basically to show that we take this into account. And what we find in the end is uh, in line with uh, our experimental observations. So yeah, to sum up things, um, so although we are not pushing the, the limits, the frontiers of, uh, let's say, uh, calorimetric detection, this can be seen as, um, as a, in my opinion, as an interesting uh, demonstration of real-time thermometry for uh, something uh, interesting uh, scientific-wise. 
And um, there can be, yeah, we actually wanted to also uh, probe the, uh, the phase dependence of the heat capacity of N, as it's a proximitized uh, metal. It should, in principle, be uh, dependent on the phase we uh, impose. But um, given our um, experimental temperature, it was uh, not uh, possible to observe such a uh, phenomenon. With that, I would like to thank you for your uh, attention. And uh, if there are some questions. I'm not <laughs>
yeah, relative to the background, the, it gets slower, but the, the absolute value of the peak, at least to me, okay. that seems that the, at, at, this isn't the yellow one is the highest at the peak. Ah, okay, um, so actually maybe this can help. Um, so basically, actually we, there's also, we also observed double jumps that I, I couldn't mention, but here uh, what we see is that the, the initial beta and the beta that we get after the jump. And as screening parameter is temperature dependent, basically it's just the temperature dependence of the critical current. And what we see is that uh, actually it's, um, for low temperature it's kind of, uh, it's corresponding to a, how to say, uh, to a saturation, but uh, as you go to the higher temperatures, yeah, I mean there is, there is it's, it's hard to, how to say, it's hard to give, it's hard to give a direct answer because you need to, again, um, put in your calculations the dissipation that is coming from the jump, your initial temperature, the heat capacity at that uh, temperature, and then get the delta T. So I cannot say that it increases linearly. Okay, thank you. I, I'm sorry, I think we have to stay on time. And thanks, uh, Efe, again. Okay.